So many thanks for returning promptly. Um, just to <coughs> recap, um, mindfulness offers a way to reconfigure, change the shape of the mind, to empower holistic intuitive whole making and the creation of novel mental models. And um, <coughs> so essentially we're saying that by paying attention in particular ways, we can um, change the shape of the mind and that when we learn how to be mindful, we're actually learning this somewhat amazing skill of changing the overall shape of our mind, the pattern of relationships between the subsystems within it. And we saw how that um, this way of understanding things both helps us see the particular um, prescription that John Kabat-Zinn gives for um, creating mindful awareness, um, paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally, how that will precisely take you to a state with holistic intuitive knowing in control rather than conceptual knowing. And um, we just touched on the idea that you know, because it's about the creation of novel mental models, those are the ones that are linked, the, the, the whole making that creates the novel mental models is the one that's linked to um, positive feelings. Um, also gives us this link to the idea of beginner's mind with life unfolding afresh in every moment. You know, life being an exciting adventure rather than just pulling out an old mental model from um, memory and just working along with that while we just spin our minds on our inner narrative. So what I want to do um, in the next section is look more closely about how this way of understanding things can give us some insights into the more detailed aspects of mindfulness. And, and the first one is really about, let me move that down. Can you still hear that? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to read a section from the book because uh, it's probably the most efficient way to do it on the distinction between goals and intentions because it can actually be immensely helpful um, to realize what the difference is between the way of controlling action when you've got holistic intuitive knowing in control and when you've got conceptual knowing in control okay so i'll just read about a page from <coughs> the book. Um, so it'll be helpful to say more about the distinction between intentions and goals in the ICS framework and how that can help resolve what might otherwise seem puzzling paradoxes. John Kabat-Zinn describes how MBSR course participants are asked to identify three goals that they want to work toward in the program but then often to their surprise we encourage them not to try to make any progress towards their goals over the eight weeks. Understandable that they would be a bit surprised given that instruction. So that um, on the one hand, they're told not to try to work toward goals. On the other, they're asked to commit wholeheartedly to at least an hour a day of mindfulness practice in a program that seems to have clear purpose and direction. And <clears throat> We often use these words, goal and intention, interchangeably. But in the ICS approach, it makes a key distinction between them. A distinction that resolves any sense of conflict or paradox between the two different sets of instructions I just mentioned. So in ICS, if we see, a goal is a conceptual idea of a future state of affairs. Something that hasn't yet happened towards which we may strive and against which we measure our progress. Now intention, on the other hand, and these are the way that actions are controlled in the holistic intuitive mode, intentions are patterns of holistic intuitive information related to actions that can be, that can be taken right now and that are likely to move us in directions we've chosen and value. And these action-related patterns can be bound in uh, 
with other patterns reflecting wider aspects of the current situation to create mental models which can guide and motivate behaviour with acute sensitivity to the wider context. So where goals focus on outcomes, intentions focus on process, things we can do, attitudes we can adopt that will by and large increase the chances that things will work out in ways we value. So for example, if I sit down to meditate with the goal of being mindful of every single breath and I end up with my mind dwelling on other things, I'll see that outcome as a failure and thoughts about why I failed and what it means will take me even further away from my breath. Or if I sit down with the goal of feeling calm and relaxed and I end up feeling tense, I'll see that as a failure. <clears throat> And that will make me feel frustrated, disappointed, irritated, and less calm and relaxed. But if I sit down to meditate with the intention to rest my attention on the breath as best I can, that intention will be included as just one aspect of the total holistic pattern that shapes what happens from one moment to the next. If I then become aware that I'm no longer mindful of the breath, it won't be seen as a failure because I haven't set up the idea of a desired future state of affairs. I haven't set up this idea of a goal. Rather, this awareness can then just be another element of the total pattern. It can act as a gentle reminder of my intention to rest my attention on the breath as best I can and so increase the chance that I'll actually do so in the next moment. So you get the sense of the different emphasis here. One is steering towards something in the future and constantly evaluating, am I there? Are we there yet, as they say? Um, the other is all about what I'm putting in to actions I can do right now that by and large will move me in directions I value, but I don't need to check moment to moment whether we're moving in the right direction. Um, so, <coughs> Let's move to another uh, aspect of mindfulness, which um, is key in a way, which is the knowing aspect of mindfulness, um, which is unusual and different from other kinds, even of holistic intuitive knowing. Um, it's what's often called meta-awareness, um, mind knowing itself. So if we look at these um, quotations, Guy Armstrong, um, Mindfulness is knowing what you're experiencing while you are experiencing it. And John Kabat-Zinn has a very similar uh, quotation, knowing what you're doing while you're doing it. Um, the Buddha, in his um, instructions for mindfulness, in the Satipatthana Sutta, every time he gives an instruction um, for mindfulness, there's the knowing in there. So, breathing in long, he knows I breathe in long breathing out long, he knows I breathe out long. Every, this element of knowing what's happening is there time after time. Thich Nhat Hanh describes uh, the knowing in mindfulness as one in which the mind experiences itself directly within itself, which is quite hard to unpack, but we'll see how we can understand that in some detail. And <clears throat> we can first pass, see that the moment-to-moment -moment creation of novel mental models allows us to know what we are experiencing as we experience it. And cleverly, our minds can use the two ways of knowing that we have to know each other. And that's what we see in meta-awareness. It's using one kind of knowing to know about the other and the, that conversation in an ongoing way creates this sense of knowing what we're doing as we do it. So, to give an example, so this is a mindfulness of the breath. Um, we've got sensations, uh, information related to body sensations coming into the holistic intuitive subsystem and they feed a mental model of breathing in long. So, a particular pattern that we know from past experience is breathing in long, but it isn't labelled at that point. Remember, this is just an implicit, intuitive sense, but it can generate a conceptual label. 
literally in those words, breathing in long. Um, concepts can be expressed not in words, but just directly in this conceptual information code. Then, and this is crucial, coming back from the conceptual subsystem is a related pattern of information, holistic intuitive information that maps onto breathing in long. And it's embedded as just one element in the new model. And this, um, this word embedded is crucial because um, we can then incorporate the conceptual information into a bigger pattern. And in just the same way that when we're reading words, we read, we don't actually attend to the letters that make up the words, although they're crucial to shaping our understanding of the word. Here, we can take advantage of the conceptual information the label that we generated without going into thinking. It's just put in there as a part of the overall model. And we have this intuitive sense within the model itself. So this is the knowing being in the awareness itself. And take that hands, the mind experiencing itself directly in itself. So it's these two um, ways of knowing, talking to each other in a way that uses conceptual information without getting lost in thinking. So we benefit from conceptual information that allows us to do the meta-awareness, knowing what we're doing as we're doing it. And so we just keep updating our models as the changing, constantly changing information from the body comes in. We're going around this loop, um, using the conceptual information to um, um, enrich our understanding of what's happening, it, we've got a direct intuitive knowing. Um, so <clears throat> while we're on this um, issue, because um, I think this is really one of the most important aspects of this model, um, it enables us to see how we can usefully um, benefit from conceptual information. And it gives you a different emphasis from some of the other uh, ways of understanding mindfulness. Because mindfulness is often described as non-conceptual. Um, so we've got Gunaratna in the Mindfulness in Plain English, you know, which is a hugely influential book, a um, very helpful book. Mindfulness is non-conceptual awareness. So we might think from that that it's got absolutely nothing to do with concepts. Whereas in fact, um, as Bhikkhu Bodhi, um, a Buddhist scholar, and many others have pointed out, you know, we couldn't manage our lives mindfully if we didn't in some way make use of conceptual information. You know, we'd be cutting ourselves off from one of the great evolutionary advantages of our species. Um, so in holistic intuitive knowing, we're making use of conceptual information, but it's not experienced as thinking, but at least partly conceptually derived and enriched. So if you want to, you could call it post-conceptual knowing. Um, the knowing of the experiences in the very awareness of it. And I can illustrate that with um, another reading um, from the book. This is an example I've used in other settings. Um, whoops. So again, I'll, I'll just read it. Um, because um, you're probably aware that with its emphasis on present-centred focus um, is often seen to be at odds with the traditional way of talking about sati, which involves recollection of the past. It's, it's not just all present focus, it's actually bringing to mind wise teachings from the past. And this way of an analysing things gives us insights into how we can do that most usefully. So, again, it's about a page. So, wise teachings we've heard in the past and wholesome intentions we've made in the past can powerfully influence our understanding and behaviour in the present. But crucially, to enjoy those benefits, we have to do more than simply recall those teachings or intentions. 
Transformation requires our minds to integrate information from the past with current information to form mental models in the present. So the crucial process is recollection plus integration into a wider whole. And I can illustrate this with a personal story. So this was in the uh, times when I was a Dharma teacher. Um, and I was in the middle of preparing a talk on the idea that suffering arises from our reactions to unpleasant feelings rather than from the feelings themselves. The idea of the two arrows that um, we encountered earlier. And I'd been thinking a lot about this idea and how to talk about it to the point where in the early hours of one morning I found myself lying in bed with thoughts about the cause of suffering being our relationship to the difficult rather than the difficulty itself floating through my mind. And then I realized with some annoyance that I'd become quite wide awake. So my mind's immediate reaction was, oh no, I don't want to be lying here awake for hours. I've got to find a way to get back to sleep. So even though I'd just been thinking about the idea that the problem isn't experience, but our relationship to it, my immediate reaction to my wakefulness was to work out how to get rid of it rather than look at how I was relating to it. Fortunately, the, the fact that I'd just been thinking about the idea meant that it was not long before I remembered the problem here isn't the wakefulness itself, but my need not to be awake. This is aversion, need to get rid of unpleasant experiences as soon as possible. So guided by this memory of that teaching, I brought mindful awareness to investigate the tension and discomfort in my body at that moment, along crucially with the knowledge this is aversion. And the, the mental model that was created by bringing those two together in that moment allowed me to sense very clearly that the source of my annoyance was my irritation with being awake, the driven quality of my need to get back to sleep, and that ironically, these were the main things keeping me awake. From that clear seeing, there flowed very naturally a letting go of the irritation and of the need to sort out the wakefulness. I consciously befriended my wakefulness and within a minute or two, I was back asleep. So, Recalling conceptual information about the origins of suffering is not by itself necessarily liberating. But when you put that conceptual understanding from the past, when you integrate it with information from the present, particularly information from the body and from feelings, everything changes. The conceptual information then becomes a vital ingredient in the liberating mix that creates a new holistic intuitive mental model, a new lens through which we can see and experience things in different, more wholesome ways. So you get, get the idea. And I think this is really important in terms of practice because you know you faithfully come along to talks, workshops like this, and you'll get all this conceptual information. And basically, um, you know, you need to bring it to mind in the moment. Um, if it's to be of use to you, if it's to be in any way transforming rather than just adding to your uh, store of conceptual knowledge. So, um, let's see where we go next. Um, oh yeah, so, this lovely um, quotation from Christina Feldman, mindfulness isn't a neutral or blank presence. True mindfulness is imbued with warmth, compassion and interest. In the light of this engaged attention, we discover it's impossible to hate or fear anything or anyone that we truly understand. And this sort of echoes the, the Buddha's teaching, you know, that we've got a noble eightfold path, and that right mindfulness includes <coughs> integration of um, right intention, you know, compassion, letting go, loving kindness. And from the perspective I've been uh, describing, we can understand the importance of these wholesome um, affects, these wholesome intentions, <clears throat> in a bit more detail. Clearly, they're good in themselves, but 
we can also see that they support the shift to the mindful shape of mind. So to do, to understand and explain uh, what I mean here, I need to back up a little bit. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So neuroscientists like the late Jack Panksepp um, suggest that our behavior, human behavior, like that of most mammals, is organized around a limited number of core affects that are uh, represented deep in our brains. And he identified about seven. And we can divide these into two different classes. There are instrumental core affects, um, the most important of which is called seeking. Um, and that's the one that gets triggered and energizes us to go and get things. You know, it's a go and do it kind of um, affect, you know, and it feels good and we get out there and we do things. Um, we get hold of what we want, we get away from or we get rid of what we don't want. They're actions that have immediately useful biological payoffs. They're instrumental. They move us towards getting something we want or getting rid of something we don't want. Non-instrumental effects, on the other hand, are more about actions that have long-term biological payoffs so that care, compassion, play, they build resources that have more long-term benefits. So clearly, you know, care of offspring or care of peers, the compassion that allows us to sort of approach suffering of our um, kin or um, peer group, um, you know, doesn't have an immediately useful payoff for us necessarily, but actually serves the longer term goal, not goal, serves the longer term, um, has a longer term effect of ensuring the survival of the genes that led to that behavior because it means that you know we're nurturing we're supporting all the people who are carrying related genes um play um you know it looks like fun just tumbling about and so on but that's equipping young animals with the skills to either catch food or escape from predators um and you know the um uh, the core affect I mentioned before, the one that gets triggered when we get separated from our social group, if we're a social mammal, um, that has the effect of keeping a social group together because certainly we know primates, non-human primates in the wild, if they're separated from the social group, then their survival is only you know, weeks at the most. They cannot survive on their own. Um, so that keeps us close to the rest of the group, not in immediately useful effect, but a longer term effect. Um, so um, it's well known that different affects have different effects on attention and on uh, the way we interpret experiences. Best established for say anxiety and depression, where you know there are clear negative biases in the memories we recall in depression in the way we focus our attention on threat, in anxiety. Um, and what I want to suggest is that um, these two different classes of affects, instrumental and non-instrumental, have um, corresponding uh, differences in their attentional style. Often um, they're linked this narrow style on the one hand and a wider style on the other to, to negative and positive emotions. But actually, the evidence maps better if you divide things in terms of the instrumental versus non-instrumental. So that if we look at the instrumental affects, they're associated with this very selective, narrow style of attention, um, homing in just on things that are related to uh, narrowing the gap between how things are and how we want them to be. And it also creates a mental world because it's conceptually based of separate, disconnected things, focus on me and my needs, and a dominance of conceptual knowing. So we've got this uh, combination of instrumental affect with narrow, select, highly selective attention, and separate, disconnected worldview and dominance of conceptual knowing. Um, some of you may well have 
be aware of this thing called the invisible gorilla experiment if you haven't seen it i suggest you just look it up online because it's it's quite it's really quite astounding when you look at it. it what what you see is an experiment that was done by some harvard psychologists some time ago where they got two groups of students and made a film of them um, passing um, basketballs to each other and some of them wore white shirts and some of them wore black shirts um, and it was described as um, an experiment in attention and you had to um, your task was to count how many times the people in the white shirt in this video that you were looking at passed the ball to each other um, in the whole video so you had to track those passes um, and they made the video uh, in such a way that in the middle of um, the film an actor dressed up as a gorilla comes into uh, the middle of the scene with all these people milling around passing balls goes like that and then exits left and they're then at the end of the experiment asked how many people you know what did you see and literally half the people failed to see the gorilla they were so focused in on the task they'd been given all they needed to do was count the book the passes of the ball by the people with white um, <clears throat> tops on and so they excluded everything else and um, a very dramatic demonstration of this um oh how did we get here oh <laughs> oh <laughs> that's interesting um right okay so uh, okay whereas if we look at non-instrumental affects where <clears throat> care compassion play the link to a generally much more spacious receptive inclusive style of attention a mental world that's other oriented focused on relatedness and care dominated by holistic intuitive knowing um someone um, just in the break um mentioned the relationship of this stuff to the ideas of ian mcgilchrist and if you know his idea of the left hemisphere world and right hemisphere world then they align very nicely with what i'm talking about here the conceptual um the dominated mind being the left hemisphere world and the um holistic intuitively dominated mind being the right hemisphere world um so here we've got a, a much more spacious receptive um focus of attention and that fits with what these affects are about trying to uh nurture those around us make sure that they survive make sure that we're connected with them and there's a lovely story that sharon salzberg tells um of a visit of the dalai lama to ims the um, meditation center that's parallel to guy house in massachusetts um she just had a really bad car accident and so the dalai lama arrives with this mass of people um and she's stuck right at the back of the crowd on crutches and um, the Dalai Lama arrives surrounded by all his security people and police and you you know if he was in conceptual mode he'd be focused on right I'm going to talk to these people and I'm going to sock it to them with compassion and all that stuff and here we go kind of thing but in fact he arrives and he just looks around and sees this person on crutches right at the back of the crowd and just go straight for that source of suffering um, and opens to it and says what happened so um, this spacious receptive mode of attention rather than this very narrow selective one so we could think in a way of two different modes of mind mode one we've got controlled by instrumental affects that are about getting what you want getting rid of what you don't want and conceptual knowing there's this narrow exclusive focus of attention and an atomistic mental world of separation mode two is controlled by non-instrumental affects and holistic intuitive knowing it's expansive it's inclusive um, it's receptive attention and it creates this interconnected mental world of relatedness and the idea that I think fits and is really helpful to remember in our attempts to sort of shift modes is that all these elements are interlinked 
So if you change one of them, you're likely to affect the others as well. If we shift from conceptual knowing to holistic intuitive knowing, we'll probably help a shift from uh, narrow attention to wide attention. If we widen our attention, get a sense of spaciousness, we'll probably support the shift from conceptual to holistic intuitive. Um, so the idea is that we cultivate um, um, non-instrumental affects, wholesome affects like compassion and care, um, kindness, um, not only because they're good in themselves, but because they support this shift. Mindfulness is all about shifting the mode of mind, the configuration in the mind. Um, we do that by disengaging instrumental affects uh, linked to conceptual knowing, by cultivating acceptance, allowing non-striving, non-judgment, etc., and cultivating the non-instrumental affects. So they help foster the switch. And this, this is just one sentence here that you know, in many ways that we could talk the whole morning about. Because these things, letting go, renunciation, forgiveness, surrender, these are the recurring themes of contemplative traditions. And once we understand that actually what's happening here is that this is a way to shift the shape of our minds, to disengage from conceptual knowing that's focused on these goals, we're letting go of the goals, we're renouncing them, we're forgiving the people who violated uh, our ideas of what should happen in the past, we're letting go of it. That supports this shift to this holistic, intuitive, spacious, uh, kindly mode of knowing, so that um, we can begin to understand traditional pathways to mindfulness and compassion, um, in this way. I'd just like you to uh, look around the room at the people in here. Just have a quick glance at the other people who are here. Scan all around the room. Okay, now for the next part of the exercise, just Sit down, please. And you might like to close your eyes for this part of the exercise, or keep them open if that's easier. And, and what I want you to do is just to spend a, a minute, a couple of minutes, um, reflecting on whether you have in your life things that are difficult to bear. Right now in your life are the things that are difficult to bear. They could be to do with money worries. I mean, there's this cost of living crisis we're facing at the moment. They could be to do with relationships. You know, maybe things aren't as harmonious as you'd like with relationships with friends or family. Maybe there's some difficulties at work that are a source of stress, however mild or severe, that are difficult to bear. Um, perhaps your health causes concern. Maybe you have aches and pains or worries about upcoming operations or worry about health of relatives. Difficult feelings you have to deal with at the moment. So just take a moment to get a sense of whether you have things that are difficult to bear. Okay, so um, I could just ask you to open your eyes if you close them um, and just put up your hand if you yourself right now have things that are difficult to bear. 
Okay, so if I could just ask you, each of you to look around now. Just put your hands back up, please, those who have things that are difficult to bear. Um, okay, so probably the majority of us in this room have things that are difficult to bear. So what I'd like you to do now is just sort of stand up again and again look around at the people in the room knowing that the majority of them also have things that are difficult to bear. You know, if you have things that are difficult to bear, so do they. So each time you look at a person, reminding yourself, yeah, you have things that are difficult to bear, and you have things that are difficult to bear. You probably have things that are difficult to bear. And you, you probably have things that are difficult to bear. Just seeing them, knowing that most likely most of the people in this room have something right now that's difficult to bear. Okay, so um, just please sit down again. Um, um, so, identifying this um, shared experience, the fact that um, I, um, I experience difficulties, I have things that are difficult to bear, and so do you, brings a sense of connection and closeness. And I remember first being introduced to this kind of exercise by um, Jan Apostolnik, as some of you may have been taught with him in this way, where he gave us the task over lunchtime, which was in Cambridge, um, as we walked around the streets, if we wanted to, over lunch, um, to look at people and say, in our minds, you, you will die, and you will die, and you too will die, and you will die. And I found that it was extraordinary the way in which this enhanced my connection to the people I saw. They weren't just sort of random beings. These were people who I felt close to. So what we just did here um, was um, to actually um, create in the moment some higher order models that bound together lower order ones. So if we see these are the individuals here including ourselves and we created this um, higher uh, level um, of um, mental model in the moment that clearly uh, may be based on things in the past, but we've created in this moment in which we see the relatedness between all the people that we've looked at. Um, and the key idea here is that if we can create more inclusive mental models, we can extend our sense of connection to others. That was what we just experienced, some of us. Um, and this is really important. And um, it, there's a nice experiment that was done by um, a group in the University of Lancaster um, some time ago called the Good Samaritan Experiment. So. What they did was to take um, students who were Manchester United supporters and they got them to fill in um, questionnaires that all, asked them all about their allegiance to the Manchester United team. So they're activating their mental models to do with being a Manchester United supporter. Um, they then um, told them there was another part of the experiment, they had to go across the campus and on the way, they encountered an actor um, who uh, pretended to fall over, twist his ankle, and needed help. And they then looked at uh, how much help was offered, depending what the jogger was wearing. If they were wearing a Manchester shirt, they offered help 92% of the time. If they were offering a Liverpool shirt, they offered help. Of course, at that time, they were huge rivals, Manchester United and Liverpool. 
only 30% of the time. And that was about the same as if they were uh, just wearing a plain shirt. So the fact that they'd activated this Manchester supporter mental model enabled them to include people wearing a Manchester shirt as we, if you like. So it's not, it's not you, it's we. And then help could follow. That's why it was called the Good Samaritan experiment. But this is the really interesting bit that comes next. Um, so in the second experiment, again, they took Manchester United supporters. Um, they uh, filled in questionnaires about their overall love of football. Um, something that they shared with Liverpool supporters, but not with non-supporters, not with people who apparently were not interested in football. And they then repeated the same thing. This time, again, lots of help to 80% to the people wearing Manchester shirts, but now 70% to those wearing Liverpool shirts, as opposed to 30% in the first study. Now, what's really important about this is that we can see that we've extended the scope of helping by activating higher order models. But those models were already there. In study one, there was a football supporter model already there, but it wasn't activated. And unless it's activated, it doesn't create that connection. So again, we're back to what is happening in the moment, the creation of a novel mental model in this moment. And that is what will overcome the duality. In fact, I haven't used the word duality up to now, but you know, clearly conceptual way of knowing creates dualities. It's subjects and objects, it's me and you, it's uh, us and them, it's, you know, that thing over there and I'm here and I'm relating to it as an object. Um, so, if we want to overcome this duality and disconnection, we not only need to have these wider models, we need to activate them. And this is bringing us on to... Um, the, I think, just let me check where we're going. I think we're going on now into inner awakening briefly um, in the past, in, in the last section. Um, so, activating these more inclusive mental models helps us connect more widely. Now, inner awakening um, was described by Zen master Dogen as to be enlightened is to be intimate with all things. So intimate meaning closely connected and engaged with all things. So how do we extend our engagement and connection to all things and beings, um, pleasant, unpleasant and neutral? What model could be so general that we could see the relatedness of everything to everything else um, through its eyes? Um, and, well, as it says there, what higher order mental models are wide enough in scope to allow us to be intimate with all things. Um, and if we go back to this, essentially we can see that um, every time we go up a level, we become more inclusive. So um, these are specific experiences and then these capture what those, these models capture what those have in common. And then these higher order models capture what this particular lot of mental models has in common. And then we can go, the higher up we go, the more we're dealing with common core essences. And if we think about um, going through life um, and this intrinsic inherent potential for whole making, constantly seeking to make connections of relatedness and to discover relationships, unbeknownst to us, is creating these higher order models all the time. And we can call them supramodels, if you like, so that where mental models sort of model the um, relationships between lower order patterns of information, um, supramodels model the relationships between mental models, them oh sorry, between mental models themselves. So we've got models here and supermodels sit above them and 
they identify something that all these different models have in common, the common core essence, if you like. Um, and it's a higher level of integration. And so, and this has been going on through, this has been going on um, throughout our lives, unbeknownst to us, you know, ticking away there, creating this stock of supermodels. And the idea is that these, oh, sorry, that these supermodels extract the core patterns shared by mental models, the distilled essence, if you like, and supermodels form the background deep templates which shape the lenses through which we perceive and interpret experience in each moment. Supermodels underpin the structure of the world or reality that we inhabit. And different supermodels create different experiential worlds and realities. So in this way of understanding things, and this is very much a Buddhist way as well, you know, we are actively creating our worlds of experience moment to moment to moment. And depending what supermodel we've got um, in dominating everything lower down, then we will see things and relate to things in a radically different way. And if we look, say, at the class of all uh, instrumental models, you know, if we look at the uh, supermodels that are distilled out of all of the mental models that have been linked to instrumental affects that are about getting what we want, uh, about selecting very narrowly uh, our focus of attention, about dividing the world into these conceptually delimited objects that we stand at a distance from, then this is a description of our default mode of mind. Um, it's controlled by conceptual meanings which parse the world into separate entities, things, subjects, objects, etc. A dualistic world to which we have a relationship of use. And that structuring that is inherent in the conceptual way of knowing for good evolutionary reasons, because it worked brilliantly for the original task that they were designed, they evolved for, um, and actually creates this perceived world of separation, thingness, utility. And those supermodels shine through the mental models we build shaping our experience world into one of dualities, subject, object, self, other, and so on. And because it's so habitual, you know, this is what we take to be a veridical view of the world. This is just how it is. This is reality. But in fact, you know, we have an alternative possibility. And the idea is that inner awakening involves seeing through the fabricated nature of the instrumental world we take as our normal reality. An awakening previously latent worlds. Remember, we've been clocking up these holistic intuitive supermodels all our lives without knowing it, anchored in alternative non-instrumental supermodels based on experience of non-instrumental awareness. Okay, so the idea is that throughout our lives, we're um, having, uh, although we're lost in mind running a lot of the time, we also have experiences of awareness, where holistic intuitive um, uh, knowing is in control. I and mean, some of them will be if we, we practice mindfulness, but they'll happen spontaneously, you know, sort of beautiful natural scene or sight of a loved one or whatever, you know, they'll just sort of, um, we activate a, a non-instrumental affect. Then the view we'll have is one of closeness and connection. It'll be a spacious, receptive awareness. Um, and this gets distilled into relevant super models. Now, the important thing is just to mention as, a, as an aside, um, is that non-instrumental here both means that it's drawing on um, experiences uh, in which non-instrumental athletes, care and compassion and play, have figured, but also um, that... Uh, we're not using the awareness for an instrumental purpose, okay? Because where mindfulness can go so wrong, and I've experienced this myself, is that we take it as a means to an end. We see, ah, I've now got this new bag of tools that I can calm my mind, I can become clear, I can become loving and whatever. So, 
here I can subcontract in my conceptually dominated task of becoming a kind, calm, clear-seeing self. I can subcontract mindfulness to that. And like with the example with the burglar that's often described, you know, a burglar is very aware when they're going through um, somebody's house, but it's in the service of a goal, clearly. This is much more about experiences where, you know, we are just lost in awe or a loving attention to somebody we care deeply about. As this, they just end in themselves. And these are the supermodels um, that we're talking about here. Um, and they actually embody the dynamics of them. So it's like the whole making, the essence of the whole making that's brought all this stuff together, including the compassion that may have allowed us to approach something unpleasant and difficult, um, including the kindness or the care that has led us to pay interest to the things around us rather than get lost in our own inner narratives. And the notion of hidden treasures is one that comes up uh, time after time in contemplative traditions, in the Christian tradition, Jesus' parables. There are a number of them that talk about hidden treasure. You know, there's this treasure buried in a field that a man um, sells everything else he has uh, to go and buy the field and dig it up. There is the pearl of great price and that we, again, sell everything else and to go and buy it. In um, in Sufism, Rumi talks about uh, seams of precious carnelian buried beneath this rickety old shack that we eke out a living in and that we have to um, tear down the shack, pull up the floorboards and dig down and find the hidden treasure. And it, even um, Eckhart Tolle in his um, book, The Power of Now, the same theme recurs. So there is something already there, and this is the crucial thing, it's already there, awaiting activation, awaiting discovery. Um, this is the good news. Um, it's just we're normally so preoccupied with our conceptual the dominated mode of mind, that we cease to be aware of it. And enlightenment is really about accessing um, these uh, supermodels that will connect us to a larger whole. We'll feel unconditional love towards people and sense some deeper dimension of wholeness shining through specific experiences. So this, I mean, I said that it was a message of hope and really it's, this is the key. We have this hidden treasure within us unbeknownst to us. And that image, that metaphor, comes through time after time in contemplative traditions and from teachers. Um, so, and I, I mentioned earlier the parallels between uh, what I'm talking about and the two ways of knowing and Ian McGilchrist's ideas of right hemisphere versus left hemisphere. His description of the right hemisphere world gives us a flavour of what the world looks like when we get these supermodels um, shaping our world of experience. A net of interdependencies, forming and reforming holes, a world with which we are deeply connected, a world where there is betweenness. Things are present to us as part of a whole which is forever in flux. In this world we too feel connected to what we experience, part of that whole, not confined in subject to isolation, from a world that is viewed as objective. The right hemisphere pays attention to the other, whatever it is that exists apart from ourselves, with which it sees itself in profound relation. It's deeply attracted to and given life by the relationship, the betweenness that exists with this other. To this world, it exists in a relationship of care. Care meaning the opposite of careless. Um, so that we're actually really interested and involved in valuing um, our experience. So, we're coming to the end now and we'll have some time for uh, questions. So, we could talk much more about the way of looking at inner awakening that this offers uh, and how we understand paths to awakening through the lens it provides. But just to say that you know, this very well-known quotation by Einstein um, captures the essence of our task. Um, a human being is part of the whole called by us universe. 
a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal de desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. And this is the beautiful um, sentence. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Okay, so this, uh, uh, just for the last two slides, I, I'm deliberately contrasting this sort of inspiring and poetic kind of holistic, intuitive, metaphorical, poetic uh, way of expressing things with the results of the kind of conceptual analysis that we've been doing today. We free ourselves from this prison by activating latent holistic intuitive system supermodels, our system, our hidden treasures, and incorporating them into the creation of novel mental models tuned to the specifics of each setting, moment after moment after moment. So <clears throat> this illustrates the power of conceptual knowing to be precise, to be explicit, to try to analyze something in a way that can then feed back to um, a holistic, intuitive dominance. In itself, it clearly isn't inspiring, <laughs> quite the opposite, but it can pinpoint us in particular directions. And so, uh, as with um, Ian McGilchrist, you know, this way of looking at things isn't trying to um, rubbish conceptual knowing and say we'd be better off without our left hemisphere. It's actually saying, we need the balance, we need the conversation between the two um, in order to live harmoniously and richly, uh, but we need to rebalance it. So uh, unlike in our present civilization, where conceptual knowing in the left hemisphere are dominant, we need to redress the balance so that holistic intuitive knowing holds sway. And then we can access these supermodels. And the task is we've got to then integrate the moment to moment in um, our life and and that's what so much of you know the work of inner awakening involves so just let's finish up with something of the more holistic intuitive metaphorical poetic kind um, there's a quotation i have from um, thomas merton which captures the essence of the world of holistic intuitive, whoops, seen through holistic intuitive supermodels very beautifully. Okay, um, and it's known as um, at the corner of Fourth and Walnut. As if you go, I forgot which. That's right. It's Louisville, one of the Louisvilles, I think, in uh, in the states. Um, yeah, in Louisville. So, and there's a little plaque that commemorates this experience that he had there. Thomas Merton, you probably know, was one of the most uh, influential Christian contemplatives of the last century, um, who lived essentially a hermit's life, but communicated very powerfully with uh, his way of writing. And this is his description of an experience. In Louisville, at the corner of Fourth and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation. This sense of liberation from an illusory difference was such a relief, such a joy to me, that I almost laughed out loud. It is a glorious destiny to be a member of the human race, though it is a race dedicated to many absurdities and one which makes many terrible mistakes. Yet, with all that, God himself gloried in becoming a member of the human race. A member of the human race, to think that such a commonplace realization should suddenly seem like news that one holds the winning ticket in a cosmic sweepstake. Isn't that nice? The idea we hold 
the winning ticket in the cosmic sweepstake. And we all have it. We just got to activate it. Okay. So thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>